Chapter 18, Part 2 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 18, Part 2 judging by the aspect of the country i believed myself to be at this time in virginia and was now reduced to the utmost extremity for want of provisions the corn that i had parched at the barn and brought with me was nearly exhausted and no more was to be obtained in the fields at this season of the year for three or four days i allowed myself only my two hands full of parched corn per day and after this i travelled three days without tasting food of any kind but being nearly exhausted with hunger i one night entered an old stackyard hoping that i might fall in with pigs or poultry of some kind i found instead of these a stack of oats which had not been threshed from this stack i took as much oats in the sheaf as i could carry and going on a few miles stopped in a pine forest made a large fire, and parched at least a half a gallon of the oats, after rubbing the grain from the straw. After the grain was parched, I again rubbed it in my hands, to separate it from the husks, and spent the night in feasting on parched oats. The weather was now becoming quite warm, though the water was cold in the rivers, and I perceived the farmers had everywhere ploughed their fields, preparatory to planting corn every night i saw people burning brush in the new grounds that they were clearing of the wood and brush and when the day came on the morning after i obtained the oats i perceived people planting corn in a field about half a mile from my fire according to my computation of the time it was on the night of the last day of march that i obtained the oats and the appearance of the country satisfied me that i had not lost many days in my reckoning I lay in this pine wood two days, for the purpose of recruiting my strength after my long fast, and when I again resumed my journey, determined to seek some large road leading towards the north, and follow it in future, the one that I had been pursuing of late not appearing to be a principal highway of the country. For this purpose, striking off across the fields in an easterly direction, I travelled a few hours, and was fortunate enough to come to a great road which was manifestly much travelled, leading towards the northeast. My bag was now replenished with more than a gallon of parched oats, and I had yet one pair of moccasins made of the rawhide. But my shirt was totally gone, and my last pair of trousers was now in actual service. A tolerable waistcoat still remained to me and my greatcoat, though full of honourable scars, was yet capable of much service. Having resolved to pursue the road I was now in, it was necessary again to resort to the utmost degree of caution to prevent surprise. Travelling only after it was dark, and taking care to stop before the appearance of day, my progress was not rapid, but my safety was preserved. The acquisition of food had now become difficult, and when my oats began to fail, I resorted to the dangerous expedient of attacking the corn crib of a planter that was near the road. The house was built of round logs and covered with boards. One of these boards I succeeded in removing on the side of the crib opposite from the dwelling, and by thrusting my arm downwards was able to reach the corn, of which I took as much as filled my bag, the pockets of my great coat, and a large handkerchief that I had preserved through all the vicissitudes of my journey. This opportune supply of corn furnished me with food more than a week, and before it was consumed I reached the Appomattox River, which I crossed in a canoe that I found tied at the shore, a few miles above the town of Petersburg. Having approached Petersburg in the night, I was afraid to attempt to pass through it, lest the patrol should fall in with me, and turning to the left, through the country, reached the river, and crossed in safety. 
The great road leading to Richmond is so distinguishingly marked above the other ways in this part of Virginia that there was no difficulty in following it, and on the third night after passing Petersburg I obtained a sight of the capital of Virginia. It was only a little after midnight when the city presented itself to my sight, but here, as well as at Petersburg, I was afraid to attempt to go through the town, under cover of the darkness, because of the patrol. Turning, therefore, back into a forest, about two miles from the small town on the south side of the river, I lay there until after twelve o'clock in the day, when, loosening the package from my back and taking it in my hand in the form of a bundle, I advanced into the village as if I had only come from some plantation in the neighborhood. This was on Sunday, I believe, although according to my computation it was Monday, but it must have been Sunday, for the village was quiet, and in passing it I only saw two or three persons, whom I passed as if I had not seen them. No one spoke to me, and I gained the bridge in safety and crossed it without attracting the least attention. Entering the city of Richmond, I kept along the principal street, walking at a slow pace and turning my head from side to side, as if much attracted by the objects around me. Few persons were in the street, and I was careful to appear more attentive to the houses than to the people. At the upper end of the city I saw a great crowd of ladies and gentlemen who were, I believe, returning from church. While these people were passing me, I stood in the street, on the outside of the foot pavement, with my face turned to the opposite side of the street. They all went by without taking any notice of me, and when they were gone I again resumed my leisure walk along the pavement, and reached the utmost limit of the town without being accosted by any one. As soon as I was clear of the city I quickened my pace, assumed the air of a man in great haste, sometimes actually ran, and in less than an hour was safely lodged in the thickest part of the woods that lay on the north of Richmond, and full four miles from the river. This was the boldest exploit that I had performed since leaving my mistress, except the visit I paid to that gentleman in Georgia. My corn was now failing, but as I had once entered a crib secretly, I felt but little apprehension on account of future supplies. After this time I never wanted corn, and did not again suffer by hunger, until I reached the place of my nativity. After leaving Richmond I again kept along the great road by which I had travelled on my way south, taking great care not to expose my person unnecessarily. For several nights I saw no white people on the way, but was often met by black ones, whom I avoided by turning out of the road. But one moonlight night, five or six days after I left Richmond, a man stepped out of the woods almost at my side, and, accosting me in a familiar manner, asked me which way I was travelling, how long I had been on the road, and made many inquiries concerning the course of my late journey. This man was a mulatto, and carried a heavy cane, or rather club, in his hand. I did not like his appearance, and the idea of a familiar conversation with any one seemed to terrify me. I determined to watch on my companion closely, and he appeared equally intent on observing me. But at the same time that he talked with me, he was constantly drawing closer to and following behind me. This conduct increased my suspicion, and I began to wish to get rid of him, but could not at the moment imagine how I should effect my purpose. To avoid him I crossed the road several times, but still he followed me closely. The moon, which shone brightly upon our backs, cast his shadow far before me, and enabled me to perceive his motions with the utmost accuracy, without turning my head towards him. He carried his club under his left arm, and at length raised his right hand gently, took the stick by the end, and drawing it slowly over his head, was in the very act of striking a blow at me, when, springing backward, and raising my own staff at the same moment, I brought him to the ground by a stroke on his forehead, and when I had him down, 
beat him over the back and sides with my weapon, until he roared for mercy, and begged me not to kill him. I left him in no condition to pursue me, and hastened on my way, resolved to get as far from him before day as my legs would carry me. This man was undoubtedly one of those wretches who are employed by white men to kidnap and betray such unfortunate people of color as may chance to fall into their hands. But for once the deceiver was deceived, and he who intended to make a prey of me had well nigh fallen a sacrifice himself. The same night I crossed the Pamunkey River, near the village of Hanover, by swimming, and secreted myself before day in a dense cedar thicket. The next night, after I had traveled several miles, in ascending a hill, I saw the head of a man rise on the opposite side, without having heard any noise. I instantly ran into the woods and concealed myself behind a large tree. The traveler was on horseback, and the road being sandy, and his horse moving only at a walk, I had not heard his approach until I saw him. He also saw me, for when he came opposite the place where I stood, he stopped his horse in the road, and desired me to tell him how far it was to some place, the name of which I have forgotten. As I made no answer, he again repeated the inquiry, and then said I need not be afraid to speak, as he did not wish to hurt me. But no answer being given him, he at last said I might as well speak, and then rode on. Before day I reached the Mattapony River, and crossed it by wading. But knowing that I was not far from Maryland, I fell into a great indiscretion, and forgot the wariness and caution that had enabled me to overcome obstacles apparently insurmountable. Anxious to get forward, I neglected to conceal myself before day, but traveled until daybreak before I sought a place of concealment. And unfortunately, when I looked for a hiding place, none was at hand. This compelled me to keep on the road until gray twilight for the purpose of reaching a wood that was in view before me. But to gain this wood, I was obliged to pass a house that stood at the roadside and when only about fifty yards beyond the house, a white man opened the door, and seeing me in the road, called to me to stop. As this order was not obeyed, he set his dog upon me. The dog was quickly vanquished by my stick, and setting off to run at full speed, I at the same moment heard the report of a gun, and received its contents in my legs chiefly about, and in my hams, I fell on the road, and was soon surrounded by several persons, who it appeared were a party of patrollers, who had gathered together in this house. They ordered me to cross my hands, which order not being immediately obeyed, they beat me with sticks and stones, until I was almost senseless, and entirely unable to make resistance. Then they bound me with cords, and dragged me by the feet back to the house, and threw me into the kitchen like a dead dog. One of my eyes was almost beaten out, and the blood was running from my mouth, nose, and ears. But in this condition they refused to wash the blood from my face, or even to give me a drink of water. In a short time a justice of the peace arrived, and when he looked at me he ordered me to be unbound, and to have some water to wash myself, and also some bread to eat. This man's heart appeared not to be altogether void of sensibility, for he reprimanded in harsh terms those who had beaten me, told them that their conduct was brutal, and that it would have been more humane to kill me outright than to bruise and mangle me in the manner they had done. He then interrogated me as to my name, place of abode, and place of destination, and afterwards demanded the name of my master. To all these inquiries I made no reply, except that I was going to Maryland where I lived. The justice told me it was his duty under the law to send me to jail, and I was immediately put into a cart and carried to a small village called Bowling Green, which I reached before ten o'clock. There I was locked up in the jail, and a doctor came to examine my legs and extract the shot from my wounds. 
In the course of the operation, he took out thirty-four buckshot, and after dressing my legs, left me to my own reflections. No fever followed in the train of my disasters, which I attributed to the reduced state of my blood by long fasting and the fatigues I had undergone. In the afternoon the jailer came to see me, and brought my daily allowance of provisions and a jug of water. The provisions consisted of more than a pound of cornbread and some boiled bacon. As my appetite was good, I immediately devoured more than two-thirds of this food, but reserved the rest for supper. For several days I was not able to stand, and in this period found great difficulty in performing the ordinary offices of life for myself, no one coming to give me any aid. But I did not suffer for want of food, the daily allowance of the jailer being quite sufficient to appease the cravings of hunger. After I grew better, and was able to walk in the jail, the jailer frequently called to see me, and endeavored to prevail on me to tell where I came from. But in this undertaking he was no more successful than the justice had been in the same business. I remained in the jail more than a month, and in this time became quite fat and strong, but saw no way by which I could escape. The jail was of brick, the floors were of solid oak boards, and the door of the same material was secured by iron bolts let into its posts, and connected together by a strong band of iron reaching from one to the other. Everything appeared sound and strong, and to add to my security, my feet were chained together from the time my wounds were healed. This chain I acquired the knowledge of removing from my feet, by working out of its socket a small iron pin that secured the bolt that held the chain round one of my legs. The jailer came to see me with great regularity every morning and evening, but remained only a few minutes when he came, leaving me entirely alone at all other times. When I had been in prison thirty-nine days, and had quite recovered from the wounds that I had received, the jailer was late in coming to me with my breakfast, and going to the door I began to beat against it with my fist, for the purpose of making a noise. After beating some time against the door, I happened, by mere accident, to strike my fist against one of the posts, which, to my surprise, I discovered, by its sound, to be a mere hollow shell, encrusted with a thin coat of sound timber, and as I struck it the rotten wood crumbled to pieces within. On a more careful examination of this post I became satisfied that I could easily split it to pieces by the aid of the iron bolt that confined my feet. The jailer came with my breakfast and reprimanded me for making a noise. This day appeared as long to me as a week had done heretofore. But night came at last, and as soon as the room in which I was confined had become quite dark, I disentangled myself from the irons with which I was bound, and with the aid of the long bolt easily wrenched from its place the large staple that held one end of the bar that lay across the door. The hasps that held the lock in its place were drawn away almost without force, and the door swung open of its own weight. I now walked out into the jail-yard, and found that all was quiet, and that only a few lights were burning in the village windows. At first I walked slowly along the road, but soon quickened my pace and ran along the highway, until I was more than a mile from the jail. Then, taking to the woods, I travelled all night in a northern direction. At the approach of day I concealed myself in a cedar thicket, where I lay until the next evening without anything to eat. On the second night after my escape I crossed the Potomac, at Hose Ferry, in a small boat that I found tied at the side of the ferry flat, and on the night following crossed the Patuxent in a canoe which I found chained at the shore. About one o'clock in the morning I came to the door of my wife's cabin, and stood there, I believe, more than five minutes, before I could summon sufficient fortitude to knock. I at length rapped lightly on the door, 
and was immediately asked in the well-known voice of my wife, "'Who's there?' I replied, "'Charles.' She then came to the door, and opening it slowly, said, "'Who is this that speaks so much like my husband?' I then rushed into the cabin and made myself known to her, but it was some time before I could convince her that I was really her husband returned from Georgia. The children were then called up, but they had forgotten me. When I attempted to take them in my arms, they fled from me and took refuge under the bed of their mother. My eldest boy, who was four years old when I was carried away, still retained some recollections of once having had a father, but could not believe that I was that father. My wife, who at first was overcome by astonishment, and was incapable of giving credit to the fidelity of her own vision, after I had been in the house a few minutes, seemed to awake from a dream, and gathering all three of her children in her arms, thrust them into my lap as I sat in the corner, clapped her hands, laughed, and cried by turns, and in her ecstasy forgot to give me any supper, until at length I told her that I was hungry. Before I entered the house I felt as if I could eat anything in the shape of food, but now that I attempted to eat my appetite had fled, and I sat up all night with my wife and children. When on my journey I thought of nothing but getting home, and never reflected that when at home I might still be in danger. But now that my toils were ended, I began to consider with myself how I could appear in safety in Calvert County, where everybody must know that I was a runaway slave. With my heart thrilling with joy when I looked upon my wife and children, who had not hoped ever to behold me again, yet fearful of the coming of daylight, which must expose me to be arrested as a fugitive slave. I passed the night between the happiness of the present and the dread of the future. In all the toils, dangers, and sufferings of my long journey, my courage had never forsaken me. The hope of again seeing my wife and little ones had borne me triumphantly, through perils that even now I reflect upon as upon some extravagant dream. But when I found myself at rest under the roof of my wife, the object of my labors attained, and no motive to arouse my energies or give them the least impulse, that firmness of resolution which had so long sustained me suddenly vanished from my bosom, and I passed the night with my children around me, oppressed by a melancholy foreboding of my future destiny. The idea that I was utterly unable to afford protection and safeguard to my own family, and was myself even more helpless than they, tormented my bosom with alternate throbs of affection and fear, until the dawn broke in the east and summoned me to decide upon my future conduct. In the morning I went to the great house and showed myself to my master and mistress. They gave me a good breakfast, and advised me at first to conceal myself, but afterwards to work in the neighborhood for wages. For eight years I lived in this region of country, and experienced a variety of fortune. At last I had saved near four hundred dollars, and bought near Baltimore twelve acres of land, a yoke of oxen, and two cows, and attended the Baltimore market. I had the great misfortune to lose my wife. I married in two years, and of my second wife had four children. Ten years of happiness and comparative ease I enjoyed on my little farm, and I had settled down into contentment, little fearing any more trouble. But a sad fate was before me. End of chapter 18, part 2